The Star's My Destination, Chapter 10 At the Costume Ball in Shanghai, Four Mile of Series electrified society by appearing as Death, Endurers, Death and the Maiden, with a dazzling blonde creature clad in transparent veils. A Victorian society which stifled its women in Perda, and which regarded the 1920s gowns of the Pina Munda clan as excessively daring, was shocked despite the fact that Robin Wensbury was chaperoning the pair. But when Four Mile revealed that the female was a magnificent android, there was an instant reversal of opinion in his favour. Society was delighted with the deception. The naked body, shameful in humans, was merely a sexless curiosity in androids. At midnight, Four Mile auctioned off the android to the gentleman of the ball. The money can go to charity, Four Mile. Certainly not. You know my slogan. Not one cent for entropy. Do I hear a hundred credits for this expensive and lovely creature? One hundred, gentlemen? She's all beauty and highly adaptable. Two? Thank you. Three and a half? Thank you. I'm bid five? Eight? Thank you. Any more bids for this remarkable product of the resident genius of the Four Mile Circus? She walks. She talks. She adapts. She has been conditioned to respond to the highest bidder. Nine? Do I hear any more bids? Are you all done? Are you all through? Sold to Lord Yale for 900 credits. Tumultuous applause and appalled ciphering. An android like that must have cost 90,000. How can he afford it? Will you turn the money over to the android, Lord Yale? She will respond suitably. Until we meet again in Rome, ladies and gentlemen, the Borghese Palace at midnight. Happy New Year! Four Mile had already departed when Lord Yale discovered, to the delight of himself and the other bachelors, that a double deception had been perpetrated. The android was, in fact, a living human creature, all beauty and highly adaptable. She responded magnificently to 900 credits. The trick was the smoking room story of the year. The stags waited eagerly to congratulate Four Mile. But Foyle and Robin Wensbury were passing under a sign that read, Double your jaunting or double your money back in seven languages and entering the emporium of Dr. Sergei Oral, celestial enlarger of cranial capabilities. The waiting room was decorated with lurid brain charts demonstrating how Dr. Oral poulticed, cupped, balsamed and electricised the brain into double its capacity or double your money back. He also doubled your money with antifebrile purgatives magnified your morals with tonic roborants and adjusted all anguished psychs with Oral's epulotic vulnerary. The waiting room was empty. Foyle opened a door at a venture. He and Robin had a glimpse of a long hospital ward. Foyle grunted in disgust. A snow joint. Might have known he'd be running a dive for hopheads too. This den catered to disease collectors, the most hopeless of neurotic addicts. They lay in their hospital beds, suffering mildly from illegally induced paramezels, paraflu, paramalaria, devotedly attended by nurses in starched white uniforms and avidly enjoying their illegal illness and the attention it brought. Look at them, Foyle said contemptuously. Disgusting. If there's anything filthier than a religion junkie, it's a disease bird. Good evening, a voice spoke behind them. Foyle shut the door and turned. Dr Sergei Oral bowed. The good doctor was crisp and sterile in the classic white cap, gown and surgical mask of the medical clans, to which he belonged by fraudulent assertion only. He was short, swarthy and olive-eyed, recognisably Russian by his name alone. More than a century of jaunting had so mingled the many populations of the world that racial types were disappearing. Didn't expect to find you open for business on New Year's Eve, Foyle said. Our Russian New Year comes two weeks later, Dr Oral answered. Step this way, please. He pointed to a door and disappeared with a pop. The door revealed a long flight of stairs. As Foyle and Robin started up the stairs, Dr Oral appeared above them. This way, please. Oh, one moment. He disappeared and appeared again behind them. You forgot to close the door. He shut the door and jaunted again. This time he reappeared high at the head of the stairs. In here, please. Showing off, Foyle muttered. Double your jaunting or double your money back. 
All the same, he's pretty fast. I'll have to be faster. They entered the consultation room. It was a glass-roofed penthouse. The walls were lined with gaudy but antiquated medical apparatus, a sedative bath machine, an electric chair for administering shock treatment to schizophrenics, an EKG analyzer for tracing psychotic patterns, old optical and electronic microscopes. The quack waited for them behind his desk. He jaunted to the door, closed it, jaunted back to his desk, bowed, indicated chairs, jaunted behind Robins and held it for her, jaunted to the window and adjusted the shade, jaunted to the light switch and adjusted the lights, then reappeared behind his desk. One year ago, he smiled, I could not jaunt at all. Then I discovered the secret, the salutiferous abstersive, which, Foyle touched his tongue to the switchboard wired into the nerve endings of his teeth. He accelerated. He arose without haste, stepped to the slow motion figure. Blue hoof behind the desk, took out a heavy sap and scientifically smote oral across the brow, concussing the frontal lobes and stunning the jaunt centre. He picked the quack up and strapped him into the electric chair. All this took approximately five seconds. To Robin Wensbury, it was a blur of motion. Foyle decelerated. The quack opened his eyes, stirred, discovered where he was, and started in anger and perplexity. You're Sergei Oral, pharmacist mate off the Vorga, Foyle said quietly. You were aboard the Vorga on September the 16th, 2436. The anger and perplexity turned to terror. On September 16, you passed a wreck out near the asteroid belt. It was the wreck of the Nomad. She signalled for help and Vorga passed her by. You left her to drift and die. Why? Oral rolled his eyes but did not answer. Who gave the orders to pass by? Who was willing to let me rot and die? Oral began to gibber. Who was aboard Vorga? Who shipped with you? Who was in command? I'm going to get an answer. Don't think I'm not. Foyle said with calm ferocity. I'll buy it or tear it out of you. Why was I left to die? Who told you to let me die? Oral screamed. I can't talk about... Wait, I'll tell. He sagged. Foyle examined the body. Dead, he muttered. Just when he was ready to talk. Just like Forrest. Murdered? No, I never touched him. It was suicide. Foyle cackled without humour. You're insane. No, amused. I didn't kill them. I forced them to kill themselves. What nonsense is this? They've been given sympathetic blocks. You know about SBs, girl? Intelligence uses them for espionage agents. Take a certain body of information you don't want told. Link it with the sympathetic nervous system that controls automatic respiration and heartbeat. As soon as a subject tries to reveal that information, the block comes down. The heart and lungs stop. The man dies. Your secret's kept. An agent doesn't have to worry about killing himself to avoid torture. It's been done for him. It was done to these men? Obviously. But why? How do I know? Refugee running isn't the answer. Vorga must have been operating worse rackets than that to take this precaution. But we've got a problem. Our last lead is Poggi in Rome. Angelo Poggi, chef's assistant off the Vorga. How are we going to get information out of him without... He broke off. His image stood before him. Silent, ominous, face burning blood red, clothes flaming. Foyle was paralysed. He took a breath and spoke in a shaking voice. Who are you? What do you want? The image disappeared. Foyle turned to Robin, moistening his lips. Did you see it? Her expression answered him. Was it real? She pointed to Sergei Oral's desk, alongside which the image had stood. Papers on the desk had caught fire and were burning briskly. Foyle backed away, still frightened and bewildered. He passed a hand across his face. It came away wet. Robin rushed back to the desk and tried to beat out the flames. She picked up wads of paper and letters and slammed helplessly. Foyle did not move. I can't stop it, she gasped at last. We've got to get out of here. Foyle nodded, then pulled himself together with power and resolution. Rome, he croaked. We jaunt to Rome. 
There's got to be some explanation for this. I'll find it by God. And in the meantime, I'm not quitting. Rome. Go, girl. Jaunt. Since the Middle Ages, the Spanish stairs have been the centre of corruption in Rome. Rising from the Piazza di Spagna to the gardens of the Villa Borghese in a broad, long sweep, the Spanish stairs are, have been, and always will be swarming with vice. Pimps lounge on the stairs, whores, perverts, lesbians, catamites, insolent and arrogant, they display themselves and jeer at the respectables who sometimes pass. The Spanish stairs were destroyed in the fishing wars of the late 20th century. They were rebuilt and destroyed again in the War of the World Restoration in the 21st century. Once more they were rebuilt and this time covered over with blast-proof crystal, turning the stairs into a stepped galeria. The dome of the galeria cut off the view from the death chamber in Keats' house. No longer would visitors peep through the narrow window and see the last sight that met the dying poet's eyes. Now they saw the smoky dome of the Spanish stairs and through it the distorted figures of corruption below. The galeria of the stairs was illuminated at night, and this New Year's Eve was chaotic. For a thousand years Rome had welcomed the New Year with a bombardment. Firecrackers, rockets, torpedoes, gunshots, bottles, shoes, old pots and pans. For months, Romans saved junk to be hurled out of the top floor windows when midnight strikes. The roar of fireworks inside the stairs and the clatter of debris clashing on the Galeria roof were deafening as Foyle and Robin Wensbury climbed down from the carnival in the Borghese Palace. They were still in costume, Foyle in the livid crimson and black tights and doublet of Cesare Borgia, Robin wearing the silver-encrusted gown of Lucretia Borgia. They wore grotesque velvet masks. The contrast between their Renaissance costumes and the modern clothes around them brought forth jeers and catcalls. Even the Lobos, who frequented the Spanish stairs, the unfortunate habitual criminals who had had a quarter of their brains burned out by prefrontal lobotomy, were aroused from their dreary apathy to stare. The job seethed around the couple as they descended the Galeria. Poggy, Foyle called quietly. Angelo Poggy. A board bellowed anatomical adjurations at him. Poggy. Angelo Poggy. Foyle was impassive. I'm told he can be found on the stairs at night. Angelo Poggy. A horn maligned his mother. Angelo Poggy. Ten credits to anyone who brings me to him. Foyle was ringed with extended hands, some filthy, some scented, all greedy. He shook his head. Show me first. Roman rage cackled around him. Poggy! Angelo Poggy! After six weeks of loitering on the Spanish stairs, Captain Peter Yang Yeovil at last heard the words he had hoped to hear. Six weeks of tedious assumption of the identity of one Angelo Poggy, chef's assistant off the Vorga, long dead, was finally paying off. It had been a gamble, first risked when intelligence had brought the news to Captain Yang Yeovil that someone was making cautious inquiries about the crew of the Prestain Vorga and paying heavily for the information. It's a long shot, Yang Yeovil had said, but Gully Foyle, AS128-127006, did make the lunatic attempt to blow up Vorga, and twenty pounds of pyre is worth a long shot. Now he waddled up the stairs towards the man in the Renaissance costume and mask. He had put on forty pounds weight with glandular shots. He had darkened his complexion with diet manipulation. His features, never of an oriental cast but cut more along the hawk-like lines of the ancient American Indian, easily fell into an unreliable pattern with a little muscular control. The intelligence man waddled up the Spanish stairs, a gross cook with a larcenous countenance. He extended a package of soiled envelopes towards foil. Filthy pictures, signor. Cellar Christians, kneeling, praying, singing psalms, kissing cross. Very naughty, very smutty, signor. Entertain your friends, excite the ladies. No, Foyle brushed the pornography aside. I'm looking for Angelo Poggi. 
Yang Yeovil signalled microscopically. His crew on the stairs began photographing and recording the interview without ceasing its pimping and whoring. The secret speech of the intelligence tongue of the inner planet's armed forces wig-wagged around foil and robin in a hail of tiny ticks, sniffs, gestures, attitudes, motions. It was the ancient Chinese sign language of eyelids, eyebrows, fingertips and infinitesimal body motions. Signor, Yang Yeovil wheezed. Angelo Poggi. Si, Signor. I am Angelo Poggi. Chef's assistant off the Vorga. Expecting the same start of terror manifested by Forrest and Orel, which he at last understood, Foyle shot out a hand and grabbed Yang Yeovil's elbow. Yes? Si, Signor, Yang Yeovil replied tranquilly. How can I help and serve your worship? Maybe this one can come through. Foyle murmured to Robin. He's not scared. Maybe he knows a way round the block. I want information from you, Podgy. Of what nature, Signor, and at what price? I want to buy all you've got, anything you've got. Name your price. But, Signor, I am a man full of years and experience. I am not to be bought in wholesale lots. I must be paid item by item. Make your selection, and I will name the price. What do you want? You were aboard the Vorga on September the 16th, 2436. The cost of that item is ten credits. Foyle smiled mirthlessly and paid. I was, Signor. I want to know about a ship you passed out near the asteroid belt. The wreck of the Nomad. You passed her on September the 16th. Nomad signalled for help and Vorga passed her by. Who gave that order? Ah, Signor. Who gave you that order and why? Why do you ask, Signor? Never mind why I ask. Name the price and talk. I must know why a question is asked before I answer, Signor. Yang Yeovil smiled greasily. And I will pay for my caution by cutting the price. Why are you interested in Vorga and Nomad and this shocking abandonment in space? Were you, perhaps, the unfortunate who was so cruelly treated? He's not Italian. His accent's perfect. But the speech pattern's all wrong. No Italian would frame sentences like that. Foyle stiffened in alarm. Yang Yeovil's eyes, sharpened to detect and deduce from minutiae, caught the changing attitude. He realised at once that he had slipped somehow. He signalled to his crew urgently. A white-hot brawl broke out on the Spanish stairs. In an instant, Foyle and Robin were caught up in a screaming, struggling mob. The crews of the intelligence tong were past masters of this OPI manoeuvre, designed to outwit a jaunting world. Their split-second timing could knock any man off balance and strip him for identification. Their success was based on the simple fact that between unexpected assault and defensive response, there must always be a recognition lag. Within the space of that lag, the intelligence tong guaranteed to prevent any man from saving himself. In three-fifths of a second, Foyle was battered, Need hammered across the forehead, dropped to the steps and spread eagled. The mask was plucked from his face, portions of his clothes torn away, and he was ripe and helpless for the rape of the identification cameras. Then, for the first time in the history of the Tong, their schedule was interrupted. A man appeared, straddling Foyle's body, a huge man with a hideously tattooed face and clothes that smoked and flamed. The apparition was so appalling that the crew stopped dead and stared. A howl went up from the crowd on the stairs at the dreadful spectacle. The burning man! Look! The burning man! But that's foil, Yang Yeovil whispered. For perhaps a quarter of a minute, the apparition stood silent, burning, staring with blind eyes. Then it disappeared. The man spread eagled on the ground disappeared too. He turned into a lightning blur of action that whipped through the crew, locating and destroying cameras, recorders, all identification apparatus. Then the blur seized the girl in the Renaissance gown and vanished. The Spanish stairs came to life again, painfully, as though struggling out of a nightmare. The bewildered intelligence crew clustered around Yang Yeovil. What in God's name was that, yo? I think it was our man, Gully Foyle. You saw that tattooed face. 
I'm the burning clothes, Christ Almighty. Look like a witch at the stake. But if that burning man was foil, who in hell were we wasting our time on? I don't know. Does the commando brigade have an intelligence service that they haven't bothered to mention to us? Why the commandos, yo? You saw the way he accelerated, didn't you? He destroyed every record we made. I still can't believe my eyes. Oh, you can believe what you didn't see, all right. That was top secret commando technique. They take their man apart and rewire and regear them. I'll have to check with Mars HQ and find out whether commando brigade's running a parallel investigation. Does the army tell the navy? They'll tell intelligence, young Yeovil said angrily. This case is critical enough without jurisdictional hassles. And another thing, there was no need to manhandle that girl in the manoeuvre. It was undisciplined and unnecessary. Yang Yeovil paused, for once unaware of the significant glances passing around him. I must find out who she is, he added dreamily. If she's been re-geared too, it'll be real interesting, Yeo, a bland voice, markedly devoid of implication, said. Boy meets commando. Yang Yeovil flushed. All right, he blurted. I'm transparent. Just repetitious, Yeo. All your romances start the same way. There's no need to manhandle that girl. And then Dolly Quaker, Jean Webster, Gwyn Roger, Marion. No names, please, a shocked voice interrupted. Does Romeo tell Juliet? You're all going on latrine assignment tomorrow, young Yeovil said. I'm damned if I'll stand for this salacious insubordination. No, not tomorrow, but as soon as this case is closed. His hawk face darkened. My God, what a mess. Will you ever forget Foyle standing there like a burning brand? But where is he? What's he up to? What's it all mean?'